So thank you, Christopher, for joining us today in another, in another lecture dialogue about our exhibition, The Architecture Machine, the role of computer in architecture. And as everybody might have, have noticed already due to, the, due to the current situation, this Corona situation, we extended the, the time of the exhibitions. Um, I mean, we had so far since October only two and a half weeks we could open the exhibition at all. So now it's closed and it's closed again. And we, we're always waiting. Maybe, maybe it's before Christmas. No, we couldn't open it before Christmas. Now we can maybe open it in January. So, I mean, the good news is uh, we have a lot of attention on online and on the social media. And also to my, to my great surprise, uh, we learned this week that the catalog is selling really wonderful. We've sold already like thousand German copies and a 500 English copies. So I guess people being frustrated, they can't see the exhibition. They just go and buy the catalog online. So maybe, maybe it's, uh, this is the good news for it. Um, so I wanna, wanna introduce today, Chris Schaupels, um, a partner of the Shop Architects and just to, to keep it very short because uh, we wanna hear his, his uh, let's say voice and his uh, opinions about also a little bit about the, the topic of our exhibition. I wanna, wanna just say he uh, made a fine arts major. Uh, so where did he come from? He made a fine arts major with a minor in political science, went to the graduate architecture program at Columbia University, earning his degree in 1990. So, and then um, he, with his uh, twin brother, William, and with friends of Colum from Colombia, they wanted to start a new kind of architecture firm that would draw connections between academia and industry, between architecture, the tech sector, and other disciplines using technology to place sustainability, lifestyle, quality life considerations. So the, 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 the office shop was then, uh, started with a really wonderful project. I, I've seen um, the carousel house in Greenport um, that's on like on Long Island. I've seen it, it's really a wonderful, uh, beautiful project. And later um, uh, started then to work on larger projects. Uh, I mean, you will talk, uh, Chris, about the, the Young Architects Program uh, Commission. I think that was one project that was very crucial for your for the office and then um, we'll show it also uh, the later much later than the Barclays Center Arena in Brooklyn a huge uh, project that was finished in 2009 so a lot of a lot of projects and most recently also Uber's new headquarters in San Francisco so the office has grown quickly and it's really uh, one of the leading leading offices i would say at the moment and i think it's it's very interesting to hear from you today a little bit, bit about your your experiences and also about the uh, experiences with the um, yeah what our topic says the the role of computers so um what we I, for those who were not able to to see the exhibition yet um i mean i guess it's 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 a lot of you in the audience, I just want to show you um, the the images of how is the work of Sharp uh, represented in our exhibition, and you can see it here in this image uh, in the exhibition. Uh, one part is the Dunescape, the uh, Young Architects Program Pavilion in uh, in Queens, and that was um, then uh, executed. You will talk about this later. Um, here on the right side, you can see a one-to-one -one, uh, model that was made uh, by us uh, on the on, on like on based on the designs. And you will tell talk about the story more. And the other the other bigger project we have in the exhibition, um, you can see here the images from the pavilion when it was up at PS1, and then the other huge project we can we are happy to present in the exhibition with a with an enormous and wonderful model is the Barclays Center from 2009 to 2012. And I hope you will tell us a little bit more about this uh, 
maybe now. So without further ado, uh, Chris, uh, please take it away. All right, well, th thank you, Professor Lepek. It's, it's a real pleasure to have an opportunity to share um, some of how we've been using technology to drive the way that we've been developing our, our design space and actually taking a lot of that, that intelligence to the, to the construction site. So I'm gonna go into the screen share here and call up the deck. And what I'm gonna do, I'm going to, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try and move through this very quickly to try and hit on some, some themes that are very much about the exhibition that um, you've put together. It really is about, you know, this whole idea of the role of technology in our space as designers. And, and, and that the idea that technology and beauty are not mutually exclusive. They can work together in terms of, of, of evolving not only how we design, but how we execute our designs in the field. Sort of going back to that earlier period uh, in the 20th century where you know, architects were involved in what we refer to as means and methods. And again, I think it's going to be important for everybody on this, this call to uh, appreciate that there are some, some discrete differences between how we operate in the United States as architects versus in, in the European Union, um, there's, there is definitely a division between how architects perform their services and how uh, the contractor performs their service. And what we've been focusing on for the last 25 years is how we can create a more collaborative relationship. So as we're all familiar, this is how we manage information a lot on a lot of pro Well, this is not how we like to manage information, but traditionally this is how it's done. And coordinating a lot of that information uh, is very, very difficult. And as we can see, the move towards building information modeling as a way to really understand how you collaborate and manage complex information in, in a virtual space. And so, and this is a, this is sort of a X-ray of American Copper, which is uh, two towers that we finished a couple years ago in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan. And what you're seeing here is all the mechanical systems and structural systems that are incorporated into this building. So the fact is the model becomes the single source of product data for the whole project. So how do we get to something like this? And I think this is, this is um, quite important for the genesis of our office that in 1995, there was an exhibition of Renaissance models at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. And we had a chance to see these, these models. It was amazing the scale of some of these models. I mean, uh, you know, in the case of the dome, it was 25 feet in diameter. But the whole idea is that the model was a key component in how the, the designer, the architect communicated the concept of the, to the, to the patron, and in this case, the Pope. But what's also interesting is how Alberti saw the role of the model, not only as a way to understand and appreciate the design, but also looking at the model as a way to sort of troubleshoot that design and even understand how much it might cost. So even some of the issues that we deal with today are very evident uh, even back in the Renaissance. So when we first started the office, we, you know, we were working in Form Z, but, uh, and, and, and MicroStation and stuff, but we weren't really using um, the digital space as a way to necessarily communicate information. So what we did, as, as, as was explained with the Carousel House that we won the commission in 1998, we actually built a large scale model and we photographed it. Um, so, the, so the challenge that, you know, as I was getting into when we first started the practice, we realized how important you know, model, utilizing models were in how we would not only design, but actually communicate our designs to our clients and to the people who would actually build the projects. Um, what was exciting is, is in the early 90s, um, a really powerful softwares were coming to the front, like MicroStation. And they were allowing us, and uh, Silicon Graphics uh, was starting to be utilized more, obviously, in the movie industry. 
but there you were starting to see some very high powered renderings that were being produced. Um, what we found interesting is how the, those platforms allowed us to really interrogate and begin to understand not only how we would design, but communicate those designs through a digital model. And so the thing is that the Renaissance show showed how important the model was as a platform for managing a process. The, the following year, there was a, a fantastic program on public television, Nova, which was on uh, the 777, uh, the Boeing's uh, new airliner that they had been developing in the, in the early 90s. And the whole project was managed through a digital platform. So not only in modeling and engineering, but how they communicated to their customers, to the mechanics, to the fabricators. So the digital model became the single source of information. And so what that meant for us, well, then, then 2000 came and we won PS1. And as you see in the show, and again, I'll, I'll take another crack at this and see if something, something happens. But what happened, what, what um, we did in, the sh in that show, and I still can't seem to move this forward. Uh, yeah, here, I'll do it this way. So the, here you're seeing, so that's, that's, this is what Boeing had produced. They had produced completely, and Airbus is doing the same thing. They were using the Dassault Systems CATIA platform in order to model every component and they could run simulation analysis. They could virtually prototype the whole aircraft before they actually physically made it. And they could send those files directly to the fabricators. And so the thing is, you know, we've been, we faced this level of complexity before in the history of architecture. And the whole idea that, you know, especially when you look at stereometry, the whole idea that all the pieces, really architecture is a three-dimensional puzzle. So how do we start to think about the way we design as this three-dimensional puzzle? And what you see here is an image of our CATIA model for a portion of the Barclays Arena. We use this model not only to analyze the structure and the design, but this was the same model that was used for direct to fabrication. So it allows us to not only virtually prototype our work in the office using models, but it allows us to actually send information out directly to, to fabricators. So where this really got started, and we didn't know it at the time, was when we did, we won this competition to do this little pavilion for this, um, for PS1 MoMA in Queens in 2000. And the whole idea, Alana Heiss was the director. She wanted us to create this urban beach. And what we did was we, we basically looked at all the components that you, you usually experience when you're on the beach, whether it's the cabana, the beach chair, the boogie board. And we created sections of each one of those sort of programs to understand what the constraints were. And this was an early sketch that was done. But then understanding how we would actually make it and do it for a very small budget where at that time was $50,000. So we really, we started thinking about what could we do to break this down and start thinking about the project quite literally grow it in section. And we started thinking about what would be the material. And here we started thinking about two by two cedar sticks, uh, 10 to 12 feet long. And the whole idea is that when people came into the museum, they actually had to move through the courtyard and through this, this architectural experience and, and really feel the idea of this sort of program section. And so as usual with all architects, we start out, you know, sort of testing ideas and model. And, you know, this is the analog version. But then we took that information and went directly into MicroStation and started modeling those components. And so what you see here is an overhead view of a 3D model that shows all the components that you need to produce Dunescape. And what you'll see in the walls in the museum that are up is we created templates. We printed them at scale. They're basically three meter sheets by, by, um, by uh, one sheet by uh, uh, approximately uh, eight meters long. And then we stack them that way we could literally build right on top of the drawings. So the thing that we learned from this project is moving away from the drawing as a representation 
to the drawing as an instruction. And so these are all the instructions that you needed to build DuneScape. And it really became this really wonderful moment where it wasn't, you could actually see how the building was, was the pavilion was actually growing and unfolding in real time. And as people came to the museum, they could actually watch it. It's like speeding up the idea of how a Gothic cathedral is over time, everybody witnesses it as it, as it goes up. And then these are some views. And what was really beautiful is the same model that generated the building generated the small scale model, which is now the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. This was a very powerful idea that the same model could operate at multiple scales. And um, so what happened after this, so there, you know, we were able to apply some of these techniques to a project that we, we had won in, in Seoul, uh, outside of Seoul, Korea for an exhibition hall. So it was, it was a great moment to actually, and this is, happens a lot with how we work in the office, is how we take these small experimental projects and then apply them to building scale opportunities. But then in 2003, we took that idea of PS1 and we pushed it further. The idea with the camera obscura was to actually design the whole building in the computer and send the files directly to the fab fabricator using, you know, con you know, uh, controlled numerically controlled um, computer process CNC. And for, you know, there's basically literally a large camera, you walk into this dark space and there's a lens with a mirror and light comes through that lens, hits the mirror and projects an image onto a round disc on the table. And so it's a very constrained space. There's lots of rules in order to make this work. And so we learned what those constraints were. And then we modeled the whole thing in Rhino. And this is before it was parametric, before we had Grasshopper and everything. So if we needed to change something, we had to go in manually and change that into digital model. But what was beautiful is we had no plans and sections in this. We literally printed out in, uh, an instruction set. And so it basically like a model kit or an Ikea piece of furniture, you, you basically filed the drawings in order to understand how to put it together. All the components for this project were basically CNC manufactured by different fabricators and then sent to the job site. And what you're seeing here is some of the files that would be sent out to these fabricators to, to have the different components made. The, what's interesting is the base foundation is concrete, but all the form work was CNC cut. So they didn't have to sit on site and figure out how to cut those shapes. So again, what was, what, and you see some of the, the angles that were produced and, and the wood slats. And what was really beautiful was we, even though this was a very small project, the idea that you could actually do the whole building this way using the model as the central form of communication, the single source of product data really set us thinking. And again, like PS1, the model that would, the digital model that was used to make the, the actual building was the same model that was used to, to create the little model, uh, which, which we have in our office. The other thing that's exciting is how you use AR and VR in terms of how you can now interrogate these models in real time. And here you see Chris Morris um, sort of moving the model around, taking the skin off, starting to understand all the different components. And again, this is something that we use in our office, but also starting to see how we use it on the construction site. So we've created a project portal that allows our clients and our fabricators to actually access this information and help you know, coordinate and collaborate in real time when, when trouble, you know, challenging issues come up. So now this brings us, now we're talking about building scale. And this is the other project that was shared that's in the, in the exhibition is, is the Barclays Arena. This is an 18,000 seat arena in downtown Brooklyn. And really the big challenge here is putting a big arena in the core of, of a city. You know, it, it's, it, it's easy to do that when you put it out in the countryside, but once you start putting a city, you're really looking at how can we break the scale of this building down, create more, much more of a human connection 
with the, with the urban context. And one of the keys here was the way that the building greeted you from the, from the central plaza and, and how you moved into it. We created this Oculus that would really open that up. And where it really became important is as you're moving from the subway and there are basically nine different subways that collapse at this one location. So majority of the people arrive here by mass transit was the idea of really opening your view and your gaze into this 18,000 seat arena. And then also riffing off of some of the qualities that we see in Brooklyn, you know, this industrial sort of um, the brownstones, the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and how we bring this into the overall design. So what's interesting is this was a quick Rhino uh, model that was generated within 10 days of getting, you know, moving into the commission. This is the model after we, we, um, we um, won the, the, uh, the fabricators won the, the job to do the envelope for the building. And then this is the final building. And what's really important that I wanna, wanna express here is how the model is an organic iterative tool that grows through the process from, design, from conceptualization through design and engineering direct to realization. And it's not something you throw away and then the builder starts you know, creating their own model, but it's, it's a shared enterprise. And so what you see here, we're using CATIA, the same aerospace software that Airbus and, and um, uh, Boeing uses in managing all the panels for this building. There's 13,000 panels. They're all different. This is not unfold that shows how we take those panels and we exfoliate them from the form. And then each panel is placed onto a mega uh, unitized system. And there's 940 of those in this project. Uh, some, you know, three meters by three meters deep by, you know, five, six, seven meters in length. So something that could easily fit on the back of a tractor trailer truck, but they're all different. And they're all being managed through this whole process of, of digital prototyping. Now, one of the challenges is when you have 13,000 panels, they're all different. You, you, that's a lot of shop drawings, a lot of shop tickets you have to generate. So what we found out is we asked the fabricator, what is the critical information that we need from you? And it's basically the information they feed to their machines and that's in this box. We took that information and our team basically generated a script that allowed us to basically automate the shop ticket process. And you know, this is this whole thing's already 10 years old, and a lot of people are already doing this. But this to us was was really fantastic. Instead of filling a whole room full of people drafting, you're basically working with the digital platform in order to optimize your, your process. And at the same time, produce something that is incredibly accurate and track trackable. And here you see some of the nesting. Uh, processes and nesting software has been around. Uh, we were using it on camera, uh, you know, back in 2002, 2003. And here you see the weathering of the steel. And the challenge is you've got 13,000 panels. And so we, we, we dog tagged all of them so we knew exactly where they were in the process. And we were able to use our iPhones to basically understand whether it was being broken, whether it was being weathered, whether it was on the truck, whether it was on the building. And we created a, um, a website that will allow the owner uh, to actually see where the progress was in the project and where there could be problems and how we could sort of resolve those problems by um, troubleshooting. And here you start to see some of the mega panels going up onto the building and a uh, view from Atlantic Avenue. The other thing that was critical to this process is as you're building the building, that model that you have, what is referred to as the digital twin, the virtual prototype of the actual building, we actually do a digital scan of the actual job site. And then we overlay that model on top of of uh, the actual digital model, the digital twin, to see if anything's off. And what we see here in this box in the blue is that one of the hanging clips is in the wrong orientation. And what was great about this is it allowed the, the construction workers to go up there and basically 
cut off those clips, reposition them so that these mega panels, when they showed up, went up right the first time. 16% of the clips on the overall building had to be repositioned. But it was critical that it was right the first time because if it didn't fit, you would have to lay those panels on the ground and then the whole possibility of having them be damaged would have been, been a huge, huge problem both money and in time. But the whole idea is, is at the end of the day, it's a three-dimensional puzzle. And this is a view of the Oculus on opening day. And there you go. So, so you know, again, as I was saying with PS1 and Camera Obscura, a lot of what we, we develop in terms of approaches to model-based delivery, came out of these pictures. And in this case, we, we were given the commission to do a series of pavilions for um, the art fair in Miami for Art Basel. And, and in this case, doing it completely through additive processes, i.e. 3D printing. And we worked with two different fabricators in this case, Branch Technology in Nashville, Tennessee, and Oak Ridge National Labs, also in Tennessee, uh, where they used uh, 3D printed bamboo. So we have carbon fiber on the left and 3D printed bamboo on the, on the right. And, and working with Branch, they had three KUKAs, uh, Rudy, Tex, and Walker. And again, we're using a CATIA model. We, we generated all the file information here and we sent it right to these KUKAs. And here you start to see them being printed up um, uh, in these different forms. And the key thing here is, we use this model also to analyze weights, sizes, so we knew that we could put this up without having to use heavy equipment. And that was critical because we only had five days to put it up and then we had to take it all down. Here you see the um, use of the 3D printed bamboo for the benches. And here you start to see the whole thing going up uh, using just plastic uh, ties to hold it together. So, all this, this would not have happened if we had just you know, drawn this in AutoCAD. Uh, the model, the digital virtual prototype, the digital twin allows us to um, you know, query the model, un, you know, run simulations through it, understand how it behaves statically, programmatically, environmentally. And these are key things that you know, when you do a project, Typically, traditionally, you do a project and then after you're done, you put that project in the flat files. Here, this information you know, is in the cloud. We're able to access it and it informs our design decisions as we move forward with different projects. And here you sort of get the idea. What was really exciting about this is we designed it for disassembly. So after the exhibition, it went to a park in the design district for two years. It weathered two hurricanes. Uh, it was taken apart and then put back up again. And now it's in at the University of Nairobi in, in Kenya. So it's the whole idea that you can design something that you could put up, but also design for disassembly, for reuse. Again, looking at how we can look at a more sustainable approach for how we think about our architecture. And then, you know, so at one point we're looking at you know, advanced manufacturing and, and, and advanced uh, material science. In our, our little pavilion we did for the furniture fair in Milan in 2017, we used terracotta and an incredibly beautiful material. You know, it's either formed or, or in, in this case, the way we looked at it, extrusions and understanding how we could bring out some of the qualities that we see in, the, in how this material has been used in history. I had actually just come back from taking my wife to Marrakesh for her 50th and had seen all this work. Now, a lot of this work is in plaster, but the idea of using these kinds of materials and bringing out that richness, that visual delight, something that you know, we're missing a lot of our architecture today. So working directly, in this case, we work with a German fabricator, NDK, um, who is just amazing in, in this, this type of material, but understanding how it's an, we're using extruded process. So the, the extrusion, the, the die mold is the same for every piece. It's how you cut it that creates the, 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 the difference, these different puzzle pieces. 
uh, as, as I was saying, every piece is different, but the basic material is the same and the structure of that material is the same. So what we did here is we needed to understand how we would load the, the, the pavilion uh, and looking at what is the best profile for that extrusion. So what you see here is basically a plan view of the standard extrusion that was used for all the different terracotta pieces for wave K. And then looking at how we would structure those elements to be self-supporting. And so what you see here is these are all the extruded terracotta pieces. And then what we did, and this is a plan view of, of the pavilion. And then this is a 3D, mod, 3D printed model, which we did in the office. The other great thing is when you work in digital models, you're able to test and prototype in real time very quickly. So we're able to run uh, you know, additive processes and really interrogate our process. And again, client always likes to see a rendering. Um, and, and here you see around. So the key thing is taking that extrusion and then applying two cuts, CNC cuts to it in order to create that unique piece. And so we sent those files directly to NBK. They put that data into their, into their cutting machine and they generated all these puzzle pieces to form, form the pavilion. And you could see the, the drawing tags are all, or what you would call the shop tickets are all rolled up and put inside the piece. And here you start to see it be put together. Metal Sigma did all the metal work. And as I said, NBK um, did all the terracotta work. And you could see here the three-dimensional puzzle literally you know, growing from that platform. And there's the whole team. Uh, Andre is the first person on the left. He's he's part of the shop team, and here you get some some views of the the. And these aren't renderings; these are actually photographs from the project. So, what's also incredible about using these digital processes is the level of precision that you're able to achieve. Uh, and so, how we can really move from a project-based orientation of thinking to a product-based one when it comes to our architecture space. So again, we, we applied that same material to a uh, high rise skyscraper that we're doing that's almost finished in New York City and really riffing off of the, the quality, the textures, the intricacy, the delight of some of the buildings that really make up the New York City skyline. The building on the far left, the Woolworth Tower was the first skyscraper built in 1913 in New York, and our office is here on the 11th floor. And that building is, 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 is dressed in terracotta. So again, how we can take some of these qualities and bring them into the 21st century. So here with 111 57th Street, we created 26 different profiles in order to create this feathered effect as light and shadow sculpt this building as the sun moves around it through the day, and then how it's tracked down through these five, five foot steps that basically feather up into the sky. And here we did a prototype out of, of um, foam core. And here you get a rendering of the effect of that sort of cycling of, of, of the different profiles as the light hits it. And then this is a rendering. And here you see the physical prototype as produced. And you see the glazes on the terracotta. Again, NBK did the work here. You've got, uh, you know, the bronze tracery. And here you start to see the build up um, as you see it uh, today. And then a view there. So I'm going to end on this last one so that we have a moment to, to have any questions. But, you know, the whole idea is how we start to use these models, uh, these, this sort of the, again, the machine, the, the, the driver for how we not only design, but communicate with fabricators, not only in our own country, but around the world. And this is the Botswana, Botswana Innovation Hub uh, outside of Gaborone in Botswana, Africa. And these are just some early renderings of the project. It, this project is so much about the building literally melting and becoming part of the landscape and creating these sort of cloistered spaces for the scientists and engineers to actually be able to go outside and really enjoy, you know, the, the opportunity to be outside of their labs 
And then the, the whole green roofs, the use of shading to help manage this, the whole, um, the whole um, challenges that we face in some climates. So again, the model is used to run simulations. Uh, this informs, you know, how we start to develop a design. But this is, this is where it gets really, really cool in our view, is imagine every project you do in the office, you have a digital model that encapsulates all the information. So instead of all your information in the flat files, you literally can access it through the cloud. And in this case, you know, I'll take um, bots one as an example. Here you're in the 3D experience, the subsystems 3D experience, and you can begin to interrogate and understand how this whole building goes together, whether it's programmatically, structurally, right down to its facade and, and to all the components that you need in order to manage not only the design, but the fabrication, right down to the hanging clips uh, that you need. And basically, as you work this process, you don't have this information in the very beginning, you, you build it. It's an iterative organic process that allows you to interface with your fabricators, with your engineers and your design team. And what's critical here is that wireframe. That wireframe is basically all the information, all the attributes that generate these, these elements is captured in the bank of this wireframe. So if, and it's all parametric. So if I move some of those aligns around, it automatically updates that, that assembly. And that's the key thing here is it, it, it gets you thinking early on in the design process how you would actually put this thing together and what materials and what are their tolerances and, and constraints. And again, the model then becomes not only a tool for fabrication, it becomes a tool for virtual design and construction where you can manage all, the, understand all your systems, whether it's structural, mechanical, programmatic, environmental, materials, uh, right down to performance. So it becomes, as, as I said earlier, like the, like the jet aircraft, your single source of product data. And what's great is that could be shared and communicated with not only people in the office, uh, but people on the ground. And here we're, we're training people in Botswana how to use the software, how to interrogate the model to help understand, you know, when you might have to troubleshoot some, some challenges. And we've even had an opportunity to train people from um, the university. So the whole idea is it's, it's really about this whole idea of tech transfer, not just sort of coming in and you know, looking for a contract and then slap it together, but really understanding how these models not only help us inform how it goes together, but could be used in post-occupancy. And so what you see here, this we've now created project portal where we can actually access all the data. And in this case, all the facade data in the model and create instruction sets. And again, as I showed with Barclays, the digital scanning to confirm that the pieces are all gonna fit nicely. And here direct, so we generated all the shop ticket information and sent it directly to our fabricator in Cape Town, South Africa. And then all the pieces arrived in boxes and like a glorified Lego or Ikea set, basically assembled in the garage of the building and then hoisted up. So again, the possibilities, you can have a variety of different uh, intricacy um, and not necessarily have, you know, the impact of cost. This project cost a tenth of the cost of the Barclays facade. So the whole idea is how we can use, utilize fabricators from all over the world, their techniques, their craft, whether it's MBK in Germany or Metal Sigma in Italy, or the fabricator here in, in Cape Town, South Africa. And so, you know, in, in closing, you know, it's, it's, it's become full circle from the Renaissance where the model was, was critical to communicating the vision, but also training the people on the ground before they walked up on, climbed up on the scaffolding, how the building would go together to hear the model as a digital uh, experience becomes the instructions and eventually the, the platform for how you would run and manage your, your building after it's completed. So on that, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen.
Thank you, Chris. That was that was amazing, and I'm I'm glad you showed uh, in the beginning again these uh, models from the Renaissance. And um, as we talked before, um, I was I I started let's say my my academic career with my PhD on on our Renaissance models. So I'm I'm always happy to see. Uh, contemporary architects referring back to this kind of this idea of the model and I mean there's no doubt that the, 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 the models that you're using and that you're describing at the moment then they're in a way so hyper complicated and complex that I think Alberti would just like give up if he would see that <laughs> I mean I love I love that you quoted Alberti and I mean uh, I, I just want to add this this little this little anecdote about um, because we were, you were talking about uh, 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 the St. Peter's in Rome. And I mean, uh, there, was, there was one architect who, who did not get the commission for St. Peter's in Rome, and it was Giuliano da San Gallo. But I mean, he made a model that was like three meter fifties high that was in this exhibition. And he also kind of, he started his architectural career as a model maker, uh, making models for other architects. So he was only the kind of the carpenter who made the models for the architects. And then he found out he would, the model would, he could, he could design them himself, himself. So I think it's interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm just maybe um, just one question from my side. And I hope there's also uh, questions from the audience, but is it like um, one of the major concerns we have now is, is really how do we preserve the models? I mean, the wooden models, that was easy. You could you could put them in a dry space and and as you know 500 years later you can show them in the exhibition space but what about your models now where how can we present them in 50 years in 100 years <laughs> let me let me ask this question as a museum director well th th you're absolutely right and, and it's funny i i still have models from when i was in un, in graduate school and it's it, and it's funny because my brother and i built models since we've we were six and you know a lot of those models don't exist anymore but we collect models a lot we if you come to our office you see lots of airplane models lots of car models and and ship models but it's a really good point i think what's really interesting though is you know we we still do a lot of you know we do a lot of laser cutting and additive processes when we build our models and i'll just give a little antidote is we finished a little museum in Santa Fe a couple of years ago. And we have this beautiful uh, aluminum panel system that went up on the building. And on um, they had a big opening and then an event uh, the night before. And uh, there, you know, is was, was a big party. And that night, the moving company came to break the party down and they backed it outside and they bent a section of it. And the next morning I had the job of walking people around and showing them the project, the building, the public. And, and uh, one of the uh, curators came by and said, Chris, you can't take them back to the other side because the truck backed into it and bent the panel. I said, no, it's not a problem. Well, I'll show it to them and then I'll call up the model on the screen and say, we've already sent the piece to the fabricator and it's already getting remade. So whether it's the actual building or making a little model in 50 years, you can send those files and reprint it again. Um, so it's not like it'll be lost, but um, you know, it's again, we love hanging on to our old models. And so you got to get plexi cases made for them. <laughs> so maybe, maybe another question is really like, um, because I'm, I'm not an architect, not trained as an architect, but as an art historian. So, I mean, this, this complexity of, of the models that you're describing using in the office and you pushed, I think, the, uh, the envelope really very far, far in this kind of, uh, make, make this kind of chain of, of like from the designer to the execution very, very close. And so that this, thing, that this can happen very, very, very smoothly. But at the same time, I'm asking myself, so how, how about this kind of little flexibility that was that was kind of possible still like in earlier times when you could reinterpret a model's uh, 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 details because it was not finalized to the last screw. I mean, is, isn't there also something left behind with this kind of complexity? 
No, it's it's actually it's it's not it's not frozen architecture like to think about it like in a Schinkel-esque way. It really is an organic iterative process. And the key is is um, it's much more open to sharing. We can collaborate collaborate in real time. It doesn't, you know, in the beginning, we don't immediately jump into Katia. We we will make you know scratch models. We'll work in Rhino and Grasshopper. We'll play around with it. But once we start to understand the constraints and we're meeting a majority of those constraints, that's when we start pulling it into these more sort of complex platforms because we need to understand that we can afford to to meet the client's you know budget and and time frame. And typically, what happens is. In, in our in the United States is that's not the job of the architect. That's the job of the builder. And what we're what we're trying to do is create a much more collaborative relationship between the two. And the model is the sole source of shared information. And so what happens is we have what is called an intention model. And that I call that like the pullover, the big sweater. And that captures all the constraints. Once that all those constraints have been signed off on and meet the overall vision of the project, the client then the budget is is set, the GMP set, and then we go into the design model. And that's when all the fabricators come in and all the all the suppliers, and then it starts to get more and more defined. So it's a very organic iterative process, and it's not like put your pencils down, you can't do any more. It, it really, we can take it up to the last minute if we wanted to. I think there's another question from Philip, Philip Schneider. He was our research assistant during the exhibition. So Philip, come on. Okay. Can, you, can you hear me now? Oh, there you go. Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, the host just allowed me to, to share my voice with you. And this is not a spam, luckily. Um, and I would have one question. So you were talking about um, many softwares. And I guess one thing, given all of your different designs and the, the, the whole complexity of the designs that is recurring in those um, projects is software interfaces. So um, while you showed the 3D experience and it seemed like a very comprehensive solution. But then if you want to take it from Katia, say to, to, to an app, uh, like you developed for the Barclays Center or to visualizing, um, what are the, the, the constraints or the, the problems in creating those software interfaces and how streamlined um, can you make it? Or how, where do you see it going? Do you think this will once become one software for all of the tasks, visualization, interaction, um, all of the performance stuff, or do you even think that would be a good thing to have one solution for? No, I, you know, it's a really great question, Bill, because in the beginning, we thought sing, one single platform would be the goal. What we realized is more about creating a tool set of different tools. And when you don't have the tool you need, you script it, you create it. And so for us, um, you know, whether it's, you know, Revit is still used because we still have to communicate with the building department. But I would say we use multiple platforms, whether it's from Rhino and Grasshopper to Revit to Revitso to um, Dassault Systems 3D Experience. But then on top of that, we have, you know, Unity. We've been working with Unity. We've been working with Autodesk. And, and visualization is so key right now. So in the show, you see we create is what we call project where we can put all this information on our phone so really as you as you as you're sort of going towards it's all about embracing many different tools and developing tools to help you solve very specific problems and so um, it's very platform based and and so the thing at the end of the day is and this is important for the architecture uh, uh, you know office is is really looking outside of just the discipline of architecture and bringing in other people, uh, especially computer science, uh, uh, manufacturing engineers. We started a new company. We've got people from SpaceX and Tesla, advisors from Boeing. And I got to tell you, 
it really opens up the way you think about what the future of architecture could be and how you use different software platforms. And, and um, so everybody is learned Grasshopper. So they understand the basic principles of scripting, but we've got people who are, you know, are able, you know, incredible relationship with Unity and understanding how we take this information and visualize it, whether it's through portals or through AR or VR. So it's, to us, it's, it's a huge expanding enterprise, but the main thing, it's a toolkit based approach. Thank okay, you. Very, thank now, you, thank uh, you. We have another can question I, by Can I ask one more question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, sorry, while we're talking about um, programming and scripting, um, where do you see um, artificial intelligence or machine learning and rationalizing um, designs like the panels on the Barclays Center? Absolutely, that machine learning AI is so critical. Basically, those models are clouds of data. And as you do one project and you move on to another project, you don't want to re reinvent the wheel. We're always reinventing the wheel when we start a new project. But environmental analysis, programmatic analysis, tra traffic analysis, material, all this information is captured in that model. And you can query it. And you do it enough, um, there's patterns that evolve. And so machine learning and AI is going to be, it's going to allow us to optimize and work much quicker, which at the end of the day allows us more time to create. So it, it is, and the other thing that's important to machine learning AI is post occupancy. After the building's done, how you use that information to improve performance. So the idea is that, you know, instead of the building getting older with time, it's an open architecture where it gets better with time. You don't throw it away. You, you, it adapts, you design for disassembly, you can upgrade it just like an air. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. So this is a, a, Super a last, interesting. Thank a, a last question, a quick question, quick answer, and then we have to wrap it up. I think Clara had another question. Yes. Hi. I hope you can see me or hear me. Um, I have a question. It comes along with the question of Mr. Lippic before. Um, I mean, in the exhibition, we also had the problem that we couldn't get a lot of um, we couldn't get a lot of plans opened because you know the programs they change so quickly. And so my uh, question is, how do you archive all your data? Because I mean, in five years, maybe, um, okay, we, I, I work with Vectorworks or with Rhino, they change in five years so dramatically. Um, how can you assure that in five years you can still access your data? It's a really good, 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 good question. And it's one that we're dealing with regularly to archive things and you keep things off site so that you can access it. But, um, you know, the cloud is really the way we operate. And um, that, you know, when you're dealing with these kinds of models and the level of complexity and the detail, you, you, it's very hard to, to operate outside of the cloud. So, of course, there's security issues. But you can constantly update and you can archive information. And, and uh, so that's something, again, I'm not the best person to talk to you about this, John Cerrone or Adam Chernick. Could you get in more detail about it? But, but the idea is, is that uh, really not just relying on our own servers, but you know, the cloud is a way to manage this level of complexity. And again, it's just like your music and everything else. It's, it's in the cloud. Now there's security issues and we've got to address those still, but you know, this is how we're, we're it's, again, it's an iterative organic way of thinking about how we manage data. Chris, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and that's an amazing experience. And I can't wait to go back and to be able to come back to New York and uh, see first your, your new building, 111 57th Street. I'm just looking forward to see that. And then I would really wanna see your, your model collection. Show me your model collection. I really am really looking forward to this, see it. So thank you a lot. Thanks for everyone joining in and um, yeah. Please, um, I mean, I hope you might, if you are able to come to Europe, then we'll want to show you the exhibition. I, I love München, as Ruth will tell you, so I look forward to getting there 
after things have settled. So thank you so much for, for allowing me to share some of our thinking with you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank Peace. you. Bye.